stunning 1800s vision by a sister in Christ, the vision of the new earth with Jesus at our forefront. We all descended from the city down to this earth on a great and formidable mountain that could not support Jesus, and it split apart. There was an immense plain. Then we looked up and saw the magnificent city with twelve foundations and twelve gates, three on each side, and an angel at every gate. We all exclaimed, The city! The magnificent city! It's coming down from God out of heaven. And it arrived and settled upon the spot where we stood. Then we began to observe the glorious sights outside the city. There, I saw the most splendid houses resembling silver, upheld by four pillars adorned with pearls, truly magnificent to behold. These were to be occupied by the saints, and within them was a golden shelf. I witnessed many of the saints entering the houses, removing their radiant crowns, and placing them on the shelf before heading out into the fields beside the houses to engage with the earth. Not as we do here. No. No. A glorious light radiated around their heads, and they continually shouted and praised God. I saw another field abundant with all types of flowers, and as I gathered them, I exclaimed, They will never fade. Next, I came upon a field of tall grass, most splendid to behold, vibrant green, with a sheen of silver and gold, as it swayed proudly to the glory of King Jesus. Then we entered a field, teeming with all kinds of creatures, the lion, the lamb, the leopard, and the wolf, all together in perfect harmony. We passed through their midst, and they followed peacefully after us. Then we entered a forest, unlike the dark woods we have here. No, no, it was light and splendid. The branches of the trees swayed gently, and we all shouted, We will dwell securely in the wilderness and rest in the woods. We traversed through the woods on our way to Mount Zion. As we journeyed, we encountered a group who were also admiring the splendors of the place. I noticed red trim on their garments, radiant crowns, and pure white robes. As we greeted them, I asked Jesus who they were. He said they were martyrs who had been slain for him. Accompanying them were an innumerable host of little ones who also had red trim on their garments. Mount Zion was just ahead, and upon the mount sat a glorious temple, surrounded by seven other mountains where roses and lilies flourished. I saw the little ones climbing, or, if they preferred, using their tiny wings to soar to the peaks of the mountains to gather the everlasting flowers. There were all sorts of trees around the temple to beautify the area. The box tree, the pine, the fir, the olive, the myrtle, the pomegranate, and the fig tree bowed down with the weight of its ripening figs, making the place truly splendid. As we approached the holy temple, Jesus raised his lovely voice and said, Only the hundred and forty-four thousand may enter this place. We shouted, Alleluia! Well, bless the Lord, dear brethren and sisters. It is a special gathering for those who bear the seal of the living God. This temple was supported by seven pillars, all of transparent gold, adorned with pearls, truly glorious. The wondrous sights I beheld there I cannot fully articulate. Oh, that I could speak the language of Canaan, then I could share a glimpse of the glory of the upper world. But if faithful, you shall soon know all about it. I saw their tables of stone, with the names of the 144,000 engraved in letters of gold. After we gazed upon the temple's glory, we exited, and Jesus left us to go to the city. Soon, we heard his lovely voice again, saying, Come, my people, you have emerged from great tribulation and have fulfilled my will, suffering for me. Enter into supper, for I will gird myself and serve you. We shouted, Alleluia, glory, and entered the city. 
I saw a table of pure silver, many miles long, yet our eyes could gaze over it. I beheld the fruit of the tree of life manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. I asked Jesus to let me partake of the fruit, and he said, Not now. Those who eat of the fruit of this land return to earth no more. But in a little while, if faithful, you shall both eat of the fruit of the tree of life and drink from the fountain. You must return to earth again and share with others what I have revealed to you. Then an angel gently bore me back down to this dark world. Sometimes I think I cannot remain here any longer. All things of earth seem so dreary. I feel very lonely here, for I have glimpsed a better land. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. Then I would fly away and find rest. Before we proceed with the interpretation of the vision, let us consider a few significant points that were of great consequence to the church of God at the time it was given. As God prepares his people for his coming to bestow immortality upon them, it was essential to correct some divergent views regarding man's future state. Questions such as, what is the future life to be? Will the saints have bodies? Will we simply sit on clouds playing harps? Where in fact is our future home in heaven or on earth? All these inquiries needed clear answers. I have often seen that the spiritual interpretation took away all the glory of heaven and that, in many respects, the throne of David and the beautiful figure of Jesus have been consumed by the fire of spiritualism. The critical point of this vision was that Christ would rule in the flesh on the literal throne of David in the new earth for eternity alongside his redeemed people. In Isaiah chapter 65, we learn that in the new earth, not only will the saints have bodies, but with those bodies they shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and partake of their fruit. They shall not build for another to inhabit, nor shall they plant for another to eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bear children for calamity, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. Isaiah 65, 21, 23. This vision became the foundation for more in-depth studies of the scriptures relating to the nature of man and what it means to be made in God's image. The hope of a future life in glorified flesh brought a much more vivid awareness of the health that God's people could experience. It also reinforced the doctrine that the body is not merely a vessel for the soul, but is an integral part of the soul itself. Beyond the revelation of these and a few other aspects of future life on the renewed earth, this field trip that this sister was shown bears no other literal significance unless it pertains to a symbolic sequence of events. Examining a few points of the vision makes it clear that a more profound meaning is hidden within the symbols. For instance, why did she have to walk through one field of flowers, then another of grass, and yet another of creatures? Why didn't Jesus guide her through one field encompassing flowers, grass, and beasts, instead of moving through separate fields? If the sole purpose of her seeing these things was to reveal their existence in the new earth, she mentions that the woods they passed through were not like the dark forests we have here, no, no, they were light and splendid. While there are some very beautiful light woods here now, not all are dark. And indeed, some dark woods here are quite lovely. Therefore, if the woods are not symbolic, it implies that in the new earth, there will never be any dark shadowy woods, nor the beautiful things that grow within them. Suppose this vision is literal, and this feast occurs in the holy city, which at that moment in the vision appeared to be on the earth. How can it be said that those who eat of the fruit of this land return to earth no more, given that they are already on the earth, the renewed earth 
as the location of Christ's throne. What then is this land of which Christ speaks if it is not part of the renewed earth? A clear distinction is made between this land and the earth. Thus, it appears again that this vision must be symbolic regarding the trees surrounding the temple. It seems very unlikely that she, at 17, living in New England in 1845, would be familiar with all these trees by sight. Therefore, alongside the vision of the trees, the spirit also impressed upon her mind the names or identities of the individual trees. Very few Bible students today could recognize an olive tree as seen by this sister despite the considerable advancements in photography since her time. The point here is, why did she mention the names of those particular trees and no others? The trees, their names, and their meanings likely carry profound significance to the church. God's people are likened to trees, Psalm 1-3, and the beauty of these trees signifies the splendor of the saints in glory. The everlasting flowers gathered by the little ones in the fields speak of the eternal life and joy the saints will experience in their home. As previously mentioned, when discussing the nature of the little ones, it seems imperative to emphasize that these children are not merely physical embodiments. They are representatives of purity, innocence, and the future hope of the redeemed. God has assured his people that they will see their children again and recognize them in the age to come, as there will be no lost children in heaven. The eternal youth and joy the little ones embody symbolize the life that will flourish in the kingdom, eternally renewed and restored. Thus, the little ones are not meant to remain physically small, but serve as a poignant reminder of the purity and innocence that all the redeemed will possess, reflecting the nature of Christ himself. She has stated elsewhere that the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life were removed from the earth before the flood and transplanted into the paradise of God. The saints will have access to the Tree of Life in heaven during the millennia. If all the saints were to emerge from the earth and mature during this time, it raises the question of why there would still be little ones at the end of the 1,000 years. After all, even if these children had been only a few years old at the time of martyrdom, they would all be over 1,000 years old after the millennium. What purpose would it serve for God to keep the resurrected, martyred little ones in a state of perpetual childhood? If they remained small, some might be unable to communicate or engage with others during that time. This suggests that their condition is more symbolic than literal. In the beginning, mankind was created in the image and likeness of God. Genesis 1, 27 God did not grant wings to Adam and Eve. They were made in his image on earth. As Christ came in human flesh to restore God's image in man, where is the biblical evidence that any redeemed will have wings in the renewed earth, as do the little ones in this vision? Jesus said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them unto babes. Matthew 11.25 In the main presentation, it will be demonstrated that this vision given to Sister Ellen is authoritative and as significant to the body of Christ as the book of Revelation and the very Bible itself. The author of the vision, the Holy Ghost, is the same author of the Bible, having granted it in fulfillment of not only the prophecy of the revelation of the voices of the seven thunders in Revelation chapter 10, but also in fulfillment of other biblical prophecies. If anyone has doubted whether or not God, through his Holy Spirit, the voices of the seven thunders, will dispel all doubt and firmly establish the work of the spirit of prophecy in the remnant church. God is alive and well and is expressing himself with thunder and light. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel 
that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. Let them measure the pattern, and if they are ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house, its fashion, its goings out, and its comings in, all its forms, its ordinances, and all its laws, and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form and all the ordinances and do them. Ezekiel 43, 9-10 the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Zechariah 4, 9, T, and 10. Those who wait and look, the time has come. Rejoice, my friends. Mercy and truth have been embraced once more, and love from above is descending our way, illuminating the path to the glorious day for those who wait and look. Arise and shine. Awake and live for the kingdom of glory, as God will give to those who wait and look. God's word as always, remains an open book, with foundations, gates, and pillars adorned with pearls, and a table of silver for good boys and girls who wait and look.